Thank you, man. God is good. Turn with me this morning to 1 Samuel chapter 16. <clears throat> We're going to read verses uh, 14 through 23. Praise God. 1 Samuel chapter 16. We'll start off here in verse 14. This first scripture we're going to read is probably one of the most scary scripture for any believer. And verse 14 says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand and when the distressing, distressing spirit from God is upon you and you shall be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. And one of the servants answered and said, look, I have seen a, a son of Jesse the Bethlehem, Bethlehemite who is a skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them by his son David to Saul. So David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And then Saul said to Jesse, saying, Please let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. And so it was, whenever the Spirit from God was upon Saul, that David would take the harp and play it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. Let's stop there. You know, I was reading an article uh, the other day about drug addiction and um, just addiction to alcohol and all type of vices, amen. And um, this article was talking about the percentage of how many uh, people relapse from recovery. And it's a high percentage. They said that 85% of those who uh, come out of recovery, 85% will relapse back into that uh, addiction in the first year, which is very high, amen? And it got me thinking about another percentage, and that is the percentage of believers who relapse back into sin, okay? And I was reading in that article, well, uh, an article pertaining to that, that I, I, in, uh, I believe in the 1930s, I think it was the Barner Research, they began to take polls of uh, attendance in church of believers, right? And people who go to church from the 1930s. And they said that uh, for decades, from the 1930s to 2020, the percentage of people, believers coming to church on any given Sunday was close to 80%. That means 80% of, of the U.S. would come to church on Sunday. But at, when, at, from 2020, the percentage of people going to church now or coming to church now is 40%. 40%. It dropped almost half. Come on. Now, I was reading that and said, wow, that is crazy. And I'm sure because of that, many believers of not attending church and being in church have relapsed back into sin. Come on. The definition of relapse is what? It's to lapse back into a state or condition, especially one involving a bad habit, okay? Uh, a bad habit is a nice word for sin, right? So there are believers, I believe because of the, not coming to the house of God, and also, and when you don't come to the house of God, it's not, and don't get me wrong, come to church don't save you, but what happens is that Coming to the house of God is a result of relationship with Christ at home. Personally. This is why we come to the house of God. Because we want to be in His presence. Not that you're not in His presence at home. But we want to be in the house of God. We want fellowship. We want to experience Him. 
Uh, we want involvement. We want to get we want to do all this thing. But it's based, so the result of coming to church, okay, I mean, the, that's the result is, is our relationship at home, okay? But unfortunately, you know, uh, many have relapsed. And this is nothing new. It started early in biblical history as we just read. But the Bible uses the word backsliding. A word that you don't really hear in, in uh, church circles anymore. If you notice that, if you go on YouTube or if you follow your favorite preacher besides me. <laughs> All right. Uh, did you notice that you hardly hear that word backsliding anymore? You, you rarely hear about it. Okay. And this is like an old school Pentecostal preacher. But really, now that it's like something, you know, you don't want to talk about backsliding. Well, well, first of all, amen. In fact, in the New Testament, I believe as Peter said that when we relapse and we go back to sin, it's like a dog returning to his vomit. So I think I like the word backsliding versus going back to my vomit. Huh. Right? So my point being is, amen, but you rarely hear about that. Why is that? Why do we not hear about uh, backsliding and relapsing? It's because I believe because of the, of the doctrine of eternal security. That once you're saved, you're always saved. Also, two an overemphasis on the on grace uh, alone. Besides preaching the whole counsel of God, now, yes, we need to preach of grace and, and and forgiveness and blessings and all that. But also, we need to preach, Amen, of consequences of, of returning back into sin, Amen, and, and our in our state uh, when it comes to our relationship with, with God. Amen. You know, here Saul, okay experience something that most experienced on that day of their conversion or salvation and you can read about it read about this his experience in chapter 10 uh, uh verses 6 it says the spirit of the lord will come upon you in power and you will prophesy and you will be changed into a different person okay uh, that was prophecy concerning saul king saul the prophet will say you know what the Spirit's going to come upon you, right? You will be changed into a whole different person. And your heart will also be changed. That is the meaning of salvation, right? So Saul experienced this back in chapter 10. He experienced salvation, conversion. He was changed into a different person. You remember that day? Wasn't it a glorious and wonderful day? But... Unfortunately, there's another side to Saul's life. Right? Just as faithfully as the Bible records his good beginnings and his life of service, it also records that he didn't continue in the way of righteousness in which he began. I told a disciple years, I'm talking about years ago, uh, maybe 15, 18 years ago, I told him, you know what? My pastor told me that, that 80% all right, of people that begin with you more than likely will not finish with you. And my pastor told me that, and I told that to this disciple. He looked at me like, no way, pastor. I'm with you till the wheels fall off. All right? I'm with you until the end, right? In fact, we remember Apostle Peter told that to Jesus too, right? He said, you know what? You can kill me. You can throw me in prison. All right? You know what? I'm, I'm down with you to the dead. And about that time, the rooster crowed, cock a doodle doo, right? You remember he turned his back on Christ when he was headed to the cross, right? This is not an easy road. Amen. The road of Christianity and the road of self denial and the road of carrying your cross, right? It's not easy. I'm not going to stand and say, oh, it's been easy and glorious. Uh, like, like, I told, like I said earlier, hey, like I said, the devil sets up a cap. In front of my house most of the time. Okay? And if it ain't the devil, it's my flesh. It ain't my flesh. It's my family. It ain't my family. It's my marriage. It ain't my marriage. It's you. If it ain't you, it's somebody else. If it ain't somebody else, amen, it's my brain. Hello? Anybody know about those attacks? So Samuel, I mean, Saul, he had a great beginning. He was anointed Israel's first king with high expectations to lead his people properly. Uh, he was going to lead God's people. He was anointed. He was tall, big, 
handsome, a leader of leaders, right? And there came a time when God had commanded him, I want you to go into this city and I want you to kill everything and anyone in this city. Do not leave a stone unturned. I want you to wipe out every person, every child, every woman. Do not take anything from this wretched city. This is my all right, command to you. Leave nothing alive. That's the way God rolled in the Old Testament. Now people get offended, amen, because you call because you, you called out their sin. Oh, I'll be in the church now, all right? Okay, and I'm leaving God too. So Saul, he went into the city, he did that, he killed everybody, he wiped everybody out, but he did one thing. He he looked at the lambs and the goats and the sheep and the animals, hey man, we're gonna have a big barbecue, man. Hey, wait, I don't know why would God want us to kill this too, right? So they you know, on the DL, they, 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 they hid them and brought them back to the camp, right? The prophet Samuel comes around and he knew something was up. God had revealed to him. And did you go do all that? Yeah, it's cool. We got all that going on. Yeah, we, we did. It goes, then why is it that I hear the bleeding of the sheep? No, no, they're, they're making noise. Bah, bah. That's the way sheep sounds. Anyways. Well, I hear them. Okay. He goes, you have disobeyed God. You're through money. It's over. You had a command and you disobeyed God. That quick. In fact, you can read about that in chapter 13. In verse 13, he says, You acted foolishly. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Like I said, God had told him, go to that city, wipe everybody out, animals, and don't take nothing, leave it alone. Just do what I told you to do. No, he brought the sheep back, brought animals back. Come on. And not only that, all right, he wasn't supposed to make any offerings to God yet. Samuel said, wait for me. And then we will offer sacrifices to God. We'll have a big church service when I get here. Well, Saul waited seven days. And he was getting impatient. And what did he do? He disobeyed God again. Huh? Samuel hadn't arrived. So he offered the sacrifice himself. This was a prohibited action. All right. Uh, the offering of sacrifice was reserved for the priest only. This was his downfall and the beginning of it. Hello? Come on. He started off well. He was running and, and running with, with the best of the best. Amen. He, he was powerful. He had the favor of God upon his life. Come on. But how many know, amen, the basis okay, for sin is usually acts of disobedience. Come on. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot here that I, that I really glean from concerning the condition that uh, people, well, how can I say, it comes... There's a condition that comes upon them. They love God. They believe in God. Okay. But when you disobey God, you you allow things to come into your life that are really troubling. Ask anyone that has backslid in the past. And you find yourself doing things that you never thought you'd be doing. And you allow some spirits to come into your life. You, but you love God, I get all that. But you find yourself troubled. You find yourself tormented. And things are not the same anymore. Okay. So Saul, amen, when he disobeyed God, he the, the instructions were specifically, uh, they were there. There was, you know, there was no, and you couldn't misunderstand it. There was not a failed communication from Samuel to Saul. But he simply disobeyed God. He thought he could offer the sacrifice. It wasn't for him to do that. It was the priest who was supposed to do that. And Samuel came on the sin, and then judgment afterwards. And he relapsed into sin. See, one of the unchanging laws of life is that whatever we sow, we shall reap. Mm -hmm. And so it was with Saul. He disobeyed God. 
And like I mentioned in the beginning in verse 14 of 1 Samuel 16, the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. I don't know about you, but that is scary. That is a fearful thing. The Bible does say it's a fearful thing to fall into the wrath of God and the hand of God. But as a believer, okay, the Lord spirit to depart from me is one, amen, that scares the living daylights out of me. Because before I gave my life to Christ, I did not have the spirit of the Lord. And look what that got me into. Look what that got you into. And he started off well. He was on fire for Jesus. He had this new position, amen, the first position as king to Israel. There was, I mean, even though, amen, God didn't want to establish a king, but the people kept crying to God, saying, we want a king like the other nations, all right? And this and that. He said, okay, I'll give you a king. Okay, but, you know, you got your king, but, you know, you got me instead. But, okay, I'll give you that. Okay, I ain't tripping. I'll give you your king. But there was aspirations of hope, amen, for Israel. But he this. Obey God. Hmm? What was the cause, amen? Well, simply like I mentioned. In a word, it was Saul's disobedience to the express command of God. Instead of joy that he experienced and the peace of communion he once enjoyed with God, now he has an aching heart and an uneasy conscience. Let me tell you something. Disobedience to God opens the door to all types of troubled spirits and tormenting spirits. So here the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. The moment the Spirit of the Lord departed, immediately the Bible says in verse 14 that a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. That quick. Come on. There's no room for error when it comes to our relationship with Christ. Right? He says, either you're hot or cold. Don't be looking for me because they ain't, ain't going to help you either. So the Bible says the moment the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, immediately a distressing spirit. Now, the King James Version, I believe, says evil spirit. Your Bible might say evil spirit. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. But the distressing spirit was simply, you know what a distressing spirit is? Well, during prayer time, you heard some prayer requests for deliverance from depression. Depression, amen, is distressing, it is tormenting, it is evil within it, in itself, right? Because we've all had bouts of depression. Isn't it ugly? Isn't it uh, draining? Isn't it hopeless and miserable when a spirit of depression comes upon us? And now we're living in a time, amen, where there are so many, amen, living with bouts of depression. And I'm talking about from the from the, 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 most spirit, the most spiritual to the less spiritual. Huh? I heard someone say something and I was like, wow. They said that, you know, like comedians, how they're funny and they joke and they're the most humorous people. But they say that the, the comedians are the most troubled people. Okay? Because they bow with depression. I'm a humorous guy and I'm saying, man, is that me? <laughs> I love Jesus, I have the joy of salvation, right? But but I do notice that I can turn like that real quick and be down. Okay. Now not, not simply because I'm just waiting God that comes upon me, but you know, I just know it. Get it? I, I know it when it comes. Hmm? So Saul, because of his disobedience to an express command of God, okay, because of him disobeying. This distressing, depressing, the spirit, evil spirit began to trouble him. Okay? Let me share something with you that I'm sure you already know. When we compromise with the world, we lose our fellowship with God. Think about it. Let's be real this morning. Okay? There's no one perfect. There's no one not guilty of this. We're all guilty of this. When we find ourselves troubled, when we find ourselves tempted, when we find ourselves discouraged, and we're about to sin, come on, and then we finally do sin, it might be for a brief moment, a day, an hour, it's like, I don't know, you name it. You, you feel the Spirit of God leave you for, a, for that time. There ain't no Jesus there at all. He has left the building, right? He does, because he has no fellowship with darkness, okay? He leaves. 
Now, if you continue in that sin for a set amount of time that's prolonged and don't stop, then if then officially, as time goes on, you officially backslide and you relapse. Right? This is why that we must immediately get on our knees and repent. Immediately we get on our knees and say, Lord, forgive me, man. <sighs> you know what? Forgive me. Keep on doing it. If it if you have to ask God to forgive you a million times, you gotta do it. Okay? Because if you, you let it prolong, you'll find yourself in a state of relapse, in a state, amen, of backslidden nature, all right? And the longer you wait, the longer it takes, amen, and for some, they never return back. Hmm? I've entitled my message this morning, Relapse to Restoration. There's hope. Okay? So in our story here, or this account of Saul's life, amen, uh, the Bible says, though, the, 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 the beginning started when he disobeyed God and the Spirit of God left Saul and this distressing, depressing spirit came upon him. Okay? Evil came upon him. Now, I, I was thinking about that. I mean, how can evil proceed from God when he had nothing to do with evil, right? But you, like, you must understand, like I said, in, the, in some translation, it does say evil spirit. But really, that word evil... Uh, in, in, in this portion of scripture means tormenting or troubled. So God allowed a troubling, uh, tormented spirit to come upon him so he could repent. Because how many know if we don't, hey, if nothing like that happens, we'll continue in sin. Hmm? We got to feel something. We got to feel the. The, the, the conviction we gotta we got sometimes we gotta be led into an, into an area we don't need to be. You have to maybe lose something, a marriage, a relationship. You you might physically you might experience something bad and terrible. It's not that God doesn't love you and He is bringing evil upon you, but He allowed this distressing spirit to come upon Saul, so he can be healed and restored. You know, when I gave my life to God in, two, in 1993, that's a long time ago, oh, 29 years. Huh? Um, uh, I found myself, like most of you, delivered, you're happy. I mean, you find a joy that you never experienced, misery, and, and, and it has left, hopelessness has left. You have hope, you have faith now, you're like, man, things are going to be better. Okay? But I have learned that I cannot do this on my own. That I must continue to obey God. All right. I must, like I said, let God transform me into a new man, a different person, give me a new heart. Okay. I have to be on it daily. That's what Paul said. I die daily. Because you know you got to die daily. And in fact, Jesus said, "Hey, if you want to be one of my disciples, you want to follow me, you got to deny yourself. Then you can pick up your cross." But now there, there are people that are really carrying the cross no more. They're giving in to every desire and every whim that the flesh will lead them to. And like I said, we're not all, uh, we're all part of it. We all failed God and we failed ourselves and we have failed and disobeyed God one time or another, at least once a week or once a month or once a year. I get that. Okay. But you must come back to God and get restored. If not, amen, you will find yourself living in torment. And in troubled times in your life. See, I remember early on in my relationship with my wife, before we got married, I didn't know that she was in church when she was young. And I used to tell her when I used to be, you know, when I was being tormented by the devil at night by these evil spirits at night. Yeah, I'd be asleep and I'd, they'd come and attack me. I didn't know what they were. And I wasn't always high every time. It wasn't the meth monsters all the time. It was evil and distressing spirits. And I would, they would choke me, and I'd gag, and I'd try to wake my wife up. To, well, she wasn't my wife then, but, you know, uh, I'd try, hey, wait, like, I want her to wake me up to help me, okay? And then, and, and, you know, and then finally I'd get up, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm scared, you know? And she knew what it was. She didn't tell me, though. She knew what it was. There were distressing and demonic spirits attacking me, tormenting me, 
All right, for whatever reason, but she knew, and, and I didn't know until later on that she had been in church and she had vaccinated herself. I'm not trying to bring, you know, talk bad about my wife, but she'll tell you that. All right. The only good thing that happened to her in her backslidden state was she found me. Praise Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> How many know God can get a bad thing and turn it good? Huh? If loving, if she said, loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. Eh? <laughs> but I put her, hey, she was tormented too. Because she was vaccinated. I hadn't been saved, but God was, you know, you know, torment. I mean, he allowed these torment. I mean, it was ugly. I didn't even want to go to sleep. And it's affecting me even now as a, as a saved individual. It's, it's hard for me to sleep. It really is because I, it's not that I, I, you know, I lived in the past. But, you know, the things that we do when we're not with Christ, they have prolonged effects at times. Though they don't have to, but sometimes they do affect us. Let's be real. See, so Saul was experiencing depression. You know, depression, it has many causes. And I'm not going to be psychoanalytical here, be a a psychologist here, but there's many reasons and many causes for depression. Sometimes it's rooted in past actions, right? Sometimes it's you know, a good definition it is it is anger that turns inward and it begins to torment you because whether someone hurt you or abused you, the anger could turn in inward and, and, and you begin to uh, it bring, begins to bring you down and, and that anger turns into depression. There's there are many reasons, right? It could also be, one of the reasons could be, it is, is that sometimes, amen, we failed and the condemnation and guilt cannot get over. Many don't admit that. I believe in Saul's case, his own guilt and the lack of any sense of God's presence resulting from his disobedience, all right, it proved too much for him to cope with. Because you understand, he was given a grand position by God to lead his people, anointed by Samuel to lead Israel. And he failed horribly because he gave in, all right, uh, to impatience and did not take heed to the instructions of the word of God on what to do in this in this uh, circumstance when he just went ahead of God and like I mentioned earlier, he did his own thing. I believe he, he was just troubled because he failed. How many know that can distress you? He couldn't take the fact that, man, I failed. I disobeyed God. I was Israel's first king, anointed by Samuel, the prophet. But I failed. And I believe this guilt just overwhelmed me. I believe he could not take it. Come on. And this distressing spirit came upon him. So what happened? If you think about it, you know, he was troubled. He was tormented. But if we're honest with ourselves, this earth and this world is troubled and tormented because it began during the fall of man. The beginning stages when Adam and he fell. Right? Okay. We bring it upon ourselves. Sometimes, amen, the condition that we experience, right, when we disobey God, we're shooting ourselves in the foot when we disobey God. Right? 99% of the time, we experience troubled times because of our own doing. Yep. I was reading about Eskimos in Canada and Greenland. Um, they, uh, it was interesting. They, they hunt bears. And the way they hunt bears and capture them, uh, what they do, they get bones from a wolf, small, the small bones, and they coil them together somehow, some way, where they boil them. They get these, these, these bones, thin bones, and they, they make them into like a coil. And they make pointed ed, points on the end, right? And what they do, they wrap blubber around them, you know, blubber from the well and polar bears, they're talking about bears and polar bears and whatever. So they, they wrap blubber around them and what they do, they put it on the path 
of the bear where he would walk because they know their paths, right? So they lay it there. And as soon as the bear finds it, he swallows the blubber, not knowing that there is a bone with points that, that's going to kill him. So the moment they swallow this blubber with the bones inside, he's dead. Maybe not at that moment, but what happens, it begins to tear the ins his insides and he begins to bleed eternally. So what happens, the Eskimos, they begin to follow the path of the blood because now he's bleeding, right? And sure enough, they find the bear, he's dead because of swallowing this hidden bone, this hidden weapon, I guess, to kill him. That, as I was reading that, I go, that reminds me of a lot of us. We take, we swallow something that thinks is gonna help us. And usually we swallow because we're going through something and in the end it kills us, spiritually, doesn't it? Come on. Mm -hmm. Or there are many who say, you know what? I'm not, you know what? I'm going to save my life for me. I'm going to keep my life for myself. I'm going to do what I want to do. You just swallowed that home. How's it working out for you? If you're trying to save your own life and do your own thing, all right, and not obeying God at all, that's not gonna work out too good for you. It didn't work out good for me. The minute you swallow that lie, you are in the process of dying and destroying your life. That's what I did. But thank God, amen, all right, that Jesus came on the scene to save me. Now, let me move on real quickly here. So here, Saul's going through this. His servants, they see him. They see that he's distressed, depressed. They even thought that he was going insane. Because I mean, no way, man. When we find ourselves emotionally crippled and depressed, amen, we act at times crazy and, and just off, right? Let's be real. So his servants like, man, <laughs> the boss, he's, he's tripped out. He's off the chain, man. Like, oh, we gotta do something. So they said, hey, I know. What? We, he needs some type of remedy, some type of something to help him. Let's get some soft music, calming music, maybe some Kenny G. Right? Right? Let, 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 let's find somebody who knows how to play the instrument and the harp, something that would just calm him because he needs something. And one of the servants said, hey, check this out, the son of Jesse. Duke can play a harp like we're going tomorrow. He's got five Grammys. Not only that, he is a soldier, he's a man of valor, he's handsome, he's all that, amen, he is the perfect man. Let's go get him. So they sent out for him, they sent for him, they go get him, all right, and all right. And, uh, and what happens, you know what, this distressing spirit, depressing spirit that's tormenting Saul, it begins to come upon him, he begins to just play his heart. All of a sudden, the distressing Spirit leaves. Well, come on. Music. You know, something about music that does something to you, huh? Yeah. Whether good or bad. You know, I'm, I've, I'm always amazed at my neighbors. When I say neighbors, wherever I live, I know those neighbors, they, they, you know, I know what condition they're in by the music they play. <laughs> like yesterday, my neighbor was playing on cheddars. <laughs> that means they're in a good mood. That means, you know what? Hey, they're feeling good. They just got paid. They're drinking a few modelos. I see them with the 12 pack. They're, they're, you know, they're like, they feel good, hey, man. Mama's acting right. Dad just got paid. Kids are doing good. You know what? But then there was those days where you got the oldies. Ah, uh, they're a little troubled. You know, the way they were, man, if I can go back when I was young, go to the park, go right, you know, you know do my thing, you know, just something, I just, oh man, just, you know, kind of good time, but kind of not, kind of try to reminisce, play the oldies, right? I'm serious. When they got hard rock and gangster rap, that means they're mad, they want to kill somebody. <laughs> They want to bust a cap in the fool. <laughs> Isn't that true that music does something to us, right? I do, I, and that's right. All my neighbors do that. And all my hallelujah here is, oh, Rabbi Shanda, Rabbi Shanda. 
Open the eyes of my high Lord. You know, I'm blind. Ain't nothing going on. I don't want to listen to music, amen. What gets me help is I, I have to pray prayer. I mean, I just pray the Lord. I need some help. I need to think of why. I need to, oh my God, you're on my brain, oh God. I got to get in the presence of God. That's what restores me. Okay, if you, hey, listen to Christian music. Well, that's fine. Hey, gang, do what you got to do, amen. Stay away from that other junk because it will get you worse condition. Come on. Mm -hmm. So, amen, they sent off for David, all right, and he, amen, and he is delivering Saul, amen, because he played, amen, spiritually, amen. He played where it soothed him, amen. I believe he played because the Holy Spirit, amen, was there. Mm -hmm. And so much to the fact that the Bible says that Saul, amen, loved him. Come on. He became his armor bearer. He, what, what was it with David? I'll tell you what it was. It wasn't his great talent in playing the harp. It wasn't his good looks or his loyalty and faithfulness to the king. It was because the Bible says he was anointed and God was with him. You can read about that. Uh, we read. He was anointed and he had the power of God upon his life. What does that mean to you and I? That if we need to be restored, you need to be in a place of an anointing upon all right, a person, whether it's through the church, whether it's through the preaching, all right, you need the anointing of God. You don't need music, you don't need to try to calm yourself through drugs and alcohol, you don't need another person, you need the anointing to be restored. David had the anointing upon his life. He had the favor of God. The Bible says God was with him. He needed to be around that. Oh, but what do we do in our lives? We go around the opposite of that, don't we? We have these evil and tormented and troubling spirits come upon us, and we do the opposite. Huh? We go drink, you go smoke, you go lay with somebody else, you do this, you do that, or whatever sin, amen, you feel that might help you, but how many know it is always short-lived? There's only temporary satisfaction for a brief moment, and now... Afterwards, you got to deal with the guilt. You got to deal with the condemnation. You got to deal with the results of that act or acts because you're trying to find comfort and needs. You find yourself in a worse condition. I know that. This is why I've been able to stay clean and sober and safe for 29 years. Because I know, amen, that if I give in to those spirits, I know exactly what's going to happen to me. I am going to die. I will die. All right? I know that. I know that for a fact. I'll die. My wife will give my truck to her new friend. <laughs> give her my clothes. And then I'll have a great old time. Uh, with all that stuff I worked hard for. Oh no, she'll never, she told me she'll never go be with a man no more. Only have friends. As long as they ain't a family friend, I'm cool. You know family, you ever hear that? Well, I would make jokes about that. You know, Oh, they're just a family friend. Mm -hmm. No family friends are battles. <laughs> uh, a lot of dogs, amen. In the heat. Let's move on. Let me try that. <laughs> the enemy of our soul does all he can to prevent you and I from seeking this peace and this joy that Saul experienced at the hand of David through his anointing. How many know that? Like we were, like Virginia said earlier. Man, you know what? I want you know. Like I got to do this in church. You know, I got to lead song. But the devil came and just he, he just. Just, just trying to up, uh, just bring an uprising in my home, and you know, just trying to distract me and deter me, right? right? That's what the devil does. He's trying to prevent you from seeking peace, seeking direction, healing by coming to church. How many times have you fell for that lie? How many times have you fell? I'm not going to church today because I'm doing something's going on at home. Come on, I'm, I'm fighting with my kids. You know, this or that. Uh, you know, you find yourself tired. I'm just tired. You're not tired. You're tired because of what you did Saturday night. 
Or you lie to yourself and say, you sneeze, hmm, I think I'm sick. Like I said many a time, if you have to think about if you're sick or not, you're not sick. You get it? If you have to think about it, hmm, am I sick today? I kind of have a little stomach ache. Hmm, I kind of have a little sniffle. If you have to think about it, you're not sick. Okay? You're being a baby. And if you're a man, you're being a wimp. Huh? <laughs> yep. We must understand, amen, that to find this peace, to find this restoration, the joy of salvation, amen, we've got to have Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Huh? Oh, but he will do everything to sidetrack and to cause you and I to seek these counterfeit pleasures or comforts. They're counterfeit. They only last for a moment. There's no peace like the peace and the joy of God and the Holy Spirit. The rest, amen, will leave you empty pocket, aching head, and an insatiable craving for more when you give in to those temptations. That's where I'll leave you. That's how I'll leave you. Come on. Oh, but how, what people do, I call that the peace of escapism. escapism. When we want to escape, remember the old commercial? Cal, go on, take me away. The lady in the bubble bath, remember, or whatever bath, remember that? Yeah. Cal, go on, take me away. How many know when we're going through torments and troubles, we want to escape? Yeah. Right? We want the peace, but it's a peace of escapism. We want that peace that if we escape, all right, we'll find, you know, some type of comfort. Oh, but let me tell you something, it will wear off. Come on. It will wear off, it'll be short-lived, and you'll find yourself with more problems. Or what many do, the psalmist said, there's a psalm, and he was troubled, and he was going through depression too, the psalm, I think, 73. And he felt like, man, you know what? I look at the wicked, I look at the unsaved, they prosper, they got everything. They're, they live carefree. They don't got no trouble like I do. Huh? They increase in wealth. Okay. And he, he felt that, you know what? That was their security. And how many know that's a big lie from the end? Because how many, you, you won't say amen, but how many did get, they maybe had a good amount of money in your pocket? Okay. I'm not talking about a thousand, you know, you know income tax nine. Inherit this time, and you have some money, okay. And you're you're like, wow, okay, you're happy for for a moment, but how many know that it doesn't bring real peace and comfort, all right? When you're troubled and you're tormented, come on. And then you look at it like you got it now, but I'm still feeling like this, huh? Yep. That's the piece of false security. That don't bring security at all. It helps you for a moment. It'll bring a, you know, a momentarily contempt in your life. But at the end of the day, it is false security. The security you need is to be under the shadow of the Almighty, as the Bible says. Yeah. The prophet Jeremiah, he knew this. Okay. And he realized, amen, that in those days, there was a lot of many false prophets trying to bring comfort to the people, right? And he knew they were false. He knew they were evil. And he said something in Jeremiah 8.10. He said, peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Basically, they don't listen to these chumps. They're liars. They're false. They're just, they're just trying to tickle your ear and give you some type of false security. He says, peace, peace. There's no peace. Where's, there's no peace in that. Come on. Don't we do that? We think there's peace in this. There's peace in that. And, oh, you know, and we get involved in all type of secular activities, thinking there'll be peace and, com peace and comfort, amen. But there is no peace afterwards. But after it's done, you find yourself in the same condition. Mm -hmm. Or you find yourself just falling into the trap of complacency where you do nothing. Come on. Your relationship with God is wrong. You know it. I know it. Huh? But you just do nothing. Complacent. Don't even try to, you don't even, can't even motivate yourself, amen, to walk to the church, to get into the church, to pray like you need to pray, to seek his word, put on a Christian song, amen, uh, get on YouTube, everybody's got a phone, listen to a preaching, if they this one, go to another one, one that comforts you and help you, come on. But we do, we procrastinate 
and we fall into a state of complacency. And that's one of the worst conditions you can do when you're going through something and you are troubled and you are tormented. You gotta get up and do something. There's a reading, there's a legend about three demons and they, uh, they were overheard planning on how to get the most victim for Satan. So these three demons and they're trying to come up with schemes and traps and deceptions. How do we get people, amen, to, to just, you know, to, to, how do we win them over, right? And the first demon said, let's tell the people there is no God. The other demon said, no, that won't do. There are too many evidences of his goodness to convince people. In other words, well, that's not going to work. People see the evidence of God all over. The second proposed, uh, let's tell them there's no hell. And the other demon said, that won't convince people because some of their fellows are there already. So the third produced the most effective way to get people to fall into this trap of complacency. Tell them there's no hurry. Huh? Oh, that demon had been doing a number on many of God's people lately. They see, we see what's going on in our world from diseases, viruses, death, lawlessness, all these things, divided families, amen, uh, drugs on our youth, drugs on the homeless epidemic, amen, the crime waves, amen, the depression, amen, the distress upon our, it's bad now, let's be real. Road rage, parking lot rage, uh, shopping cart rage. I about killed the fool the other day at Walmart. Because they were just going like two miles an hour. Like, I got places to go, man. I got to go to church. I'm ready to kill somebody, right? <laughs> Wait, man, old lady. Huh? I need to call a la carte, whatever that app is. Well, I don't know the name. You guys know it. But sure, you know, you use an iPhone, smartphone. Because they're old. I'm just saying that because hey, I still don't know how to use it. I'm talking about myself. I still go to the store, actually. I did, the other day I went to the store and, and I gave them real money. They're like, the, the, the young girl like, what's this? Because everybody uses their phone, their smart Apple Pay, they use all these things. And I think they're not used to getting cash anymore. Anyways, I don't know that. Hmm? Let me bring this to a close. So, God's people are not, he, the spirit of, and the demon spirit has convinced people not to hurry no more. You got time. Okay. Give it to this, the escape of false security, the escape of this or that, and, and you'll find peace there. When the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You cannot escape. All right? The only thing that will bring peace and comfort and deliverance is salvation. You can't escape. You got to go to that. So in our story, amen, in verse 23, it says, And so it was, whenever the Spirit from God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play with his hand, then Saul would become refreshed and well. And the distressed spirit would depart from him. He got restored. Hmm? The spirit of God was upon Saul. If you like that part, you missed it when I read it. Huh? Verse 20, and the, so it was whenever the spirit of God was upon Saul. Do you remember how we started off? The spirit of God left Saul. Remember? Verse 14. Now, in verse 23, the spirit of God was upon Saul. It came back. Why? Because he saw. The anointing and the power from a man that God was using through that vessel, David. But you know what's amazing? Is, I don't know what the word is. It's a paradox or ironic. Is that this, uh, the, the Saul, it said that he loved David. But you can read where Saul began to throw javelins at him when he was playing the harp. I mean, sometimes, amen, the thing that brings us the most comfort and peace, we rebel against. Remember, he threw the javelin at him because he was jealous because Saul, Paul, I mean, David was getting popular and people loved him. And his jealousy, amen. That's what I'm saying. When you disobey God, all kinds of things come up, spirits come upon you. 
distress, discouragement, depression, jealousy, anger, resentment, bitterness, all these spirits, they may will bombard you. But if you remain in the power and the anointing of God in your life and seek Him daily, amen, you won't have to worry about them to the point, amen, that you're going to fall every second. There's confidence and faith in God, amen, that He will keep you and God will keep those who want to be kept. But you must do your part. But if you get it into your flesh daily, amen, and don't put effort, you're going to find yourself in a more troubling condition that you start off with. This is why I know that if I leave God, okay, and the Spirit of God leaves me, and something else is going to follow me, I might as well go and kill myself, because that's what's going to happen. Death will be, amen, for my, the future, for my life. All right? Because I can only imagine how worse. If the Bible says that, you know, when the Spirit, of, when, when, when the Spirit, the Spirit leaves a man, okay, it comes back seven times worse or ten times worse. I will, hey, my addiction almost killed me. I can imagine it being seven times worse. Lord, I mean, my wife, she needs to run for the hills. Mm hmm Yep. But there was hope. There's always a good ending to the story. On this account, the fallen chapter is doesn't get too good for Saul because he remained. Even though he got restored, he was refreshed and Healed, well, he went back to his old devilish ways. And we know in the end, he ended up, amen, uh, committing suicide. You know that? Hmm? The depression finally got to him. Hmm? This tormenting, troubled spirit got to him. Yep. Relapse to restoration. This bar has this afternoon.